Tech Talk with Matthew Dickerson. Uh, 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 Matthew Dickerson. Tech, 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 tech talk. Tech, 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 tech talk. Sit back and relax. It's time to talk technology. Hello, all you wirelessly charged smart gadgeteers. Welcome to another Tech Talk with Matthew Dickerson. It's a beautifully warm 33 degrees and sunny outside right now. But of course, this show has been recorded and you may well be listening anywhere in the world. So that information is completely irrelevant to you. So I'm just letting you know that at the time of recording and just outside our studio, it was a really nice day outside. Also, at the time of recording, I was joined by Matthew Dickerson with a large suitcase full of stories of the latest world in the world of technology. How are you going, Matt? It's interesting, isn't it? They still do weather reports on the radio and you do wonder why. Because back in the old days, before we had instant access to every bit of information available, yeah. you'd tune into the radio and hear the weather forecast for the day. So you just give it a weather that forecast help you for, out. for now, which is, as you say, somewhat irrelevant for most of our <laughs> listeners. But <laughs> assuming it was, but assuming this was a live radio station, you'd be talking about the weather and saying what's going to happen today. And, and I actually do wonder why they bother to do that anymore. There's got to be a reason, and it's got to be better than it's what we've always done. Well, Surely. I think that's about it, actually. I think that's about <laughs> as far as it goes. Because now you look at your watch or you look at your phone or you jump yeah. on the internet or so many ways to check the weather. Why do we even bother about hearing about the weather? Because five seconds after they've announced it, it's irrelevant then. Let's Maybe they're assuming that there's a lot of people working inside um, dark rooms and stuff that <laughs> it may listening be that. to the radio it while they that. work who, away. Who knows? <laughs> but it, it's actually really interesting too. When you look at media in general – I remember the headlines, or I wasn't around when the headlines were on there, but I remember seeing the headlines of Bradman out. So, of course, Don Bradman's dismissed, mm. and you see a newspaper come out with Bradman out as the news story of the day. And you would see the newspaper stands out the front of news agents with that as the major headline sitting out there in large, bold print. So you'd come in and buy the newspaper. We don't need to know that Bradman's out anymore, but I still think there's a role for a newspaper to play, for example, in how he got out and the story behind yeah. how he got out and, and the fight that he had with his mother the day before and the reason Bit of analysis out, there. Yeah. All that analysis, I think there's still a part for that. But the actual news about what happened, mm. we already know that. We yeah. know that instantly. As soon as <laughs> as soon as it's happened, we've it's blasted across everywhere. But the why, the how, yeah. the analysis, I think there's still a huge component of that that modern media can really invest itself in. But yeah, we, we don't need to know Brabant's out, but we want to know all the bits and pieces behind that. So it's yeah. a changing world. Very much so. Now, on to our first story. Have you got visible cord troubles? I do, heaps of them. Cords streaming out of the back of monitors and TVs that hang off walls and such. It's messy, messy, messy. Now, I never had this problem with the big, heavy, boxy cathode ray telly, uh, tellies of the old uh, yesteryear. Let me spit that out. Everything was hidden by the big, heavy box, of course. Now that TVs are thinner and lighter, they all seem to perch neatly on the wall, but the trade-off is the unsightly cord business still. Matt, I know there are a couple of ways around this with uh, cord tyres and you know, the, the tidiers and, and whatnot that go behind the TV, but they're still there and I know about them. What has modern tech got for me to cure my ills? I'm just picturing this big CRT TV Mounted on the wall. <laughs> it yeah. doesn't quite work, does it? <laughs> so you're well, right. We tried it in schools for a bit. We used to hang them from the roof even. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, anyway. And you're right. right. You used to have these beautiful old TV cabinets. Yeah, they, and they did two things. They made your TV look magnificent, majestic even in the lounge room. But of course, as you said, all the cords, you couldn't see them because they were all associated with that. Yeah. Now you hang it from the wall and that's a problem. Now, I want to go back to Nikola Tesla here. We do mention Tesla, not just the car brand, but the individual Nikola mm -hmm. Tesla from time to time. And he was a bit obsessed about wireless stuff and a whole range of things he was trying to develop. Now, now there's a rumour that has it that Tesla actually even invented wireless um, transmission of electricity as well. well uh, and and I, don't, whether, I don't know the truth in that, but I'm prepared to perpetuate the rumour <laughs> on this podcast at least. Um, but because George Westinghouse had no way of charging people for it, um, they, they tried to stamp on um, that. Well, there's a couple of things to that. The actual concept he became a bit obsessed with. Now, he'd, he'd done 
fairly well in the late 1800s. It had the big AC-DC war with Thomas Edison, of course, mm. where they demonstrated with the execution of a horse about the... Uh, the elephant. The, the yeah, elephant yeah. was. I thought it was yeah, a horse. Yeah, no, uh, Topsy the Elephant. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. You, you can talking actually watch the, it on YouTube if you're uh, that macabre. Right, they're anyway. talking about the dangers of power and all the rest of it. So, of yeah. course, Edison was pushing DC... Nikola was pushing AC, and there were places for both. Yeah, it was Westinghouse who was the businessman, and Tesla yeah. was just the guy who was advancing the science. Correct, that's right. So he, he needed a backer, and obviously, well, he did work for Edison at one stage. Yeah. And then when I think Edison said, I'm not going to pay you for that little thing because you're not doing what I told you to do, he spat the dummy and off he went and then became a major competitor. But with all those things, I mean, the induction motor was one of Tesla's, so yep. they talk about the induction motor as one of the 10 greatest inventions of all mm. time. That's pretty impressive. So lots of things he did, but when he was very well known and known to be very clever and a great inventor, he became a bit obsessed with that whole concept about wireless power, as you suggest. He had this idea that you could have this global electricity supply using the earth and also using towers, maybe even suspended balloons, and the concept worked theoretically, mm. but the amount of power you needed to put in because you're losing that energy effectively 3D. So yeah, you're right. putting a huge amount of power in to then send it out in every direction and a little receiver sitting over here somewhere might just pick up a little tiny bit of all that power that you're producing. So apart from the charging scenario, I don't know about the charging scenario. I haven't actually had any good data around whether Westinghouse said, I can't charge people for it, so why am I going to do it? But I think more... You mean I've got to produce that many megawatts yeah. to be able to get to a little tiny light bulb over there? Not sure that's the best idea. But wireless in general, Tether was a big fan of. So he wanted to really go forward with that. Now, he was ahead of his time in so many ways, but if he was around now, he'd be so excited because we as a society have become a bit obsessed with wireless as well. Not necessarily wireless power, although we've got a couple of stories that might touch on that today, but mm. really in terms of just wireless everything, take the landline in America, for example, in 2008, you had an 80% penetration of physical landlines in homes in the US. So I'm surprised it was only 80%. I would have thought it would be more like 99.9%. .9%, but at least 80% of people in America had a landline in their home. Fast forward to 2022, that's down to 28%. Not yeah, that we don't right. use telephones now, but we've all got a mobile phone. It's wireless. So we've got so many things that are wireless. And this here is the latest solution to a first world problem. We've got a TV, <laughs> we're hanging on the wall, and as you said, oh, look at those cables, they're ugly. What are we going to do with them? Sure, you might put a hole in your wall and drop those cables down and then pull them out the bottom of the wall and take them somewhere. It's a bit of work to do that. It's all a bit clumsy. And if you've got a house, an older house, that might have brick interior walls, you don't have that little cavity just to drop those cables down inside That's of. That's right. So LG recognise this problem and they say, we've got a solution for you. We've got a solution to the first world problem. Happy days for all you people out there that have had this really gnawing away at you and the frustration of those cables. They've now got a TV or a series of TVs with the Zero Connect TV box. And it's a bit of marketing in there. It's not quite Zero it's Connect. It's not quite Zero, is it? No, that's right. It's <laughs> minimal Connect maybe, but right. zero, is a, yeah. zero is a pretty definitive sum of nothing. You would think it is, but they've tried to make it a bit ambiguous, haven't they? They have a little bit. So what you do with the Zero Connect TV is you have a Zero Connect box you sit that box somewhere in the room, put it in a TV cabinet below the TV, put it out in the middle of the lounge room, put it in a cupboard next door, wherever you want, within 10 metres of your TV, and that's what you plug everything into. So your streaming boxes, your pay TV boxes, any USB devices, etc., etc., you plug all those things into your Zero Connect TV box, and then that transmits beautiful 4K, 120 hertz signal to your TV wirelessly. All you've got to have then is the TV, wherever you want the TV, on the wall, on a cabinet, whatever, with power. So you still need power oh, there. Oh, there's still a cord there. Still one cord. And there's the ambiguity about zero. <laughs> That's right. Now, you can <laughs> probably get away a bit easier, though, having a power point tucked in behind the TV, maybe. Yeah. But still, one power, and then everything else is zero, mm. which means if you do tuck it all away down the wall, and as in the old days, you add an extra device. Oh, now I've got to pull the TV off and yeah. fish that down there and then get my bit of fishing line to pull it back up again and oh, a little bit clumsy. Whereas this zero connect box, 
plug in a USB device, plug in a new device, whatever it is, that's fine. You've got it all there somewhere conveniently located to plug everything into. Your stereo, for example, you might want that plugged in somewhere else. So you can do all of that. Who has a stereo still these days? Yeah, well, I was thinking of more a, a bar. Or like oh, a sound bar. Okay, sound bar. yeah, gotcha. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, all right. But it is interesting, isn't it? Because people talked about these beautiful 3D surround stereos that you can put with the speakers up the back of the room. But again, yeah. they need power. Yeah. No one told me about that. <laughs> they need power up there. <laughs> so you're right, they don't necessarily have stereos, but they might have a sound bar. Yeah. Everything that you want connected, though, you can connect via the Zero Connect box and then transmit all of that wirelessly. So it just tidies up things. It's now, certainly L- better than what I've got right now. Exactly right. Which it's is a, step a mess forward. of cords. So they're only doing it at the moment for their signature TV series. So that means the 77-inch, 83-inch, and 97-inch TVs are the only ones they've got in the LG range. But that's today. That's right now. I can mm. imagine that, obviously, as we go forward, They'll bring it into other TVs in their range. Other companies will look at this. If it's successful for LG, then you can imagine, as so often happens, they go and say, that's a great idea. I'll steal it from that particular company now. Mm-hmm. That sort of uh, replication or copying is the greatest form of flattery. So no. when, when, when someone steals the idea, then obviously it was a great idea. So other companies I can see saying, this is working fantastic. Let's go and do this. So I like the idea. Will it take off? Gee, I let me think about this one. I think it will actually. I think people will get to that point where they're sick of trying to fit around with their cables. Well, I wonder if it, uh, that makes the um, the actual TV itself a little bit thinner and more lightweight if it hasn't got all that uh, processing stuff that's within it. Yeah, that's a good point too. Now it's got to have some receiving capabilities on there, yeah. but that's so that's just a receiver. That's right. That's replacing the physical connection. So quite possibly, and LG have done some pretty thin TVs mm. in the past. We've talked about many on this show. So. You might be right. It might be a way to progress that TV even further forward. So keep an so eye out for it those. Has z- negative density. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> well, having a single power cord is a big change. Make no mistake. But it's still a cord, though, and I know it's there. Now we're getting close, however. Matt, I will remind you that it is 2023 and there's got to be a better solution than that. I'll give you one more chance. Thank you. So we went almost all the way with the Zero Connect Plus One box. (laughs) But another company said, you know what, I'm not going to go and make TVs. Someone else has made TVs out there. I'm going to use our intelligence. We're going to use our property, our, our professional knowledge to actually create something that's building on the TV and giving us a true Zero Connect TV. So they've come up with the idea. This is a company called Displace. They've come up with the idea of using one of the normal TVs, transmitting all the data, as we've just talked about, but adding some batteries to the TV and throwing away the remote control. Wow. Now, it gets better, kind of maybe, because (laughs) (laughs) they've also said it's all a bit hard screwing that thing on the wall and getting at your level and making sure it's perfectly level and then maybe you want to move to a different wall some stage. So they've actually got a proprietary active loop vacuum technology device built into the back of the TV. So literally you stick it against a TV, wow. turn on the vacuum loop and that TV will stick there. Now not on a rough wall, yeah. not on a brick wall. <laughs> it's got to be a nice wall. I would imagine glass would be absolutely fantastic. Jip rock or drywall, as you might call it in America, would be pretty mm. good, I would think. Yeah. But you wouldn't want to have a porous surface to try, try and put it on because obviously it's not going to work with a vacuum. Yeah. Now, the other minor problem is that it's got four batteries, which they say will last about a month. So you have another charging device, you charge it up and you swap it over once a month or so. It doesn't actually, or it does, sorry, use those batteries, uses power to keep the vacuum technology vacuumed. So it's not as if you've got Uh, some sort of device you put on the wall and then take the air out and just leave air pressure holding it up there. It's kind of topping up that vacuum pressure. So you put your TV on the wall, happy days. You're watching it and you get a low power signal to say replace the batteries, otherwise the TV might fall off the wall. So you do that. (laughs) But then you go away on holidays and you forget to take your vacuum sealed TV off the wall and you come come back. (laughs) That's right. We've been broken into. Hang on. You didn't actually see the warning come up on the screen to say, Mm. by the way, you need to recharge your batteries. Now, it's also gone down the path of the remote controllers out the window. 
And I thought they might have gone with voice activation because that's getting pretty good now when you talk to your remote control on a TV and tell it what station to go to or search for a movie or whatever it might be. That seems to work quite well, but they don't want a remote for you to talk into. This one relies on hand movements. Now, we've seen this before, and it's never been that good. And I also worry watching a grand final, watching a cricket final or something. (laughs) and you're Changing channels and stuff when you're getting excited. That's right. I know. They're going to score. You jump up in the air. Everybody just sit still. And then they go to another channel. So (laughs) that's an interesting one. They believe that. All you need is the TV, obviously the Zero Connect box concept as well, but just the TV sitting there, always looking for remote control. Where's the remote? Oh, it's down behind the Mm, couch or in between the couch cushions or my child had it in the pocket when they went back to their bedroom (laughs) and you find the remote. What's the remote doing in the bedroom? How did it – what are the series of steps? In the dirty laundry. That's right, (laughs) that it took to get to here. So all those problems are going to be done away with by – this is the cordless TV without even a power cord. So mm. we're getting there. We're getting closer and closer. I think next we just need the nuclear power plant in the TV so you don't need to recharge the batteries once a month, just the, the the little mini nuclear reactor there just to keep it running for, you know, a lifetime or so. Forever. Yeah, forever. That should do it. <laughs> Now, here's a story for the security conscious. Smart locks have been around for a little while now, and smart deadbolts are nothing new. But wiring these things up to a power source has been, up until now, limited to the realm of a licensed tradie. Wireless charging deadbolts are now available, and the DIY edge to them, well, that'll give them the the chance to fly out the door like hotcakes, I reckon. What do you reckon, Matt? Well, I think absolutely, and we are focused a bit on wireless at the moment. I talk about often health is the next realm. You often talk about material science, and wireless is obviously a really big area mm. of development that's occurring at the moment, wireless charging with our phones. We've just talked about two stories using zero or minimal connections, and this is one that I think is a pretty important one. This is getting back to Nikola Tesla's idea of charging power devices through the air. Now, Mm. not global power supply like Nikola imagined, Mm. but this is getting a focused power supply on one small device with a very small amount of power that might be needed. The exciting part about this is that exactly as you said, if you want to have permanent power going through to your smart deadbolt, then you've got to have that nice flexible cable that can handle the door opening and closing several hundred thousand times or how many times it's meant to last. And then you've got to run that through the door and get it to the actual lock. And so you need a trade. You're going to try and do it yourself. Your wife comes in and says, what are you doing with the door ripped apart like that? (laughs) Are you ever going to fix that big channel through there? No, it looks really good. I'll show people what I've done here. (laughs) So I've got some smart dev vaults that use batteries. And you can have rechargeable batteries, obviously, or replaceable batteries. But it is a bit of a hassle to actually pull them out and recharge them or swap the batteries over when they go flat. And I've got one of my deadbolts probably goes a few months before I have to replace batteries. Another one goes about a month before I've got to replace recharge batteries. So it's not ideal. And then you worry about, again, that concept of going away on holidays, Mm. coming back and going to swap your fingerprint or wave your watch in front of it and nothing happens. (laughs) I saw that warning light before we went away. I knew I should have replaced those batteries. How do we get inside now? So there are all those problems. This does away with all those. Now, it's an Alfred 2B, sorry, Alfred DB2S, and it's a standard deadbolt, smart deadbolt that you'd expect all the normal features in the way you open it and the way you access it via your app. So I'm not going to talk about those features, but it's got batteries in it, or you can replace those batteries with a smart, they call it a my charge charging backplate and or oh, sorry Y charge WI hyphen charge backplate and so that backplate basically replaces the batteries it's got some battery in it as well because obviously it needs to be able to keep working when the charger isn't accessing it isn't yeah. charging it and then you put a Y charge transmitter somewhere within that magical distance of 10 meters again and what that will do is that just transmits a very low power signal out into the air, and this receiver picks up enough with enough strength to just keep those batteries topped up. I think that's amazing. It is, isn't it? Incredible. Now, as you can imagine, they're not going to use much power. Yeah. The smart lock is sitting there most of the time doing not very much. The time that it's got a heavy drain on Hopefully the battery. Hopefully just being locked. That's right. Hopefully it's sitting there, and if you need a, a draw on the battery, it's when it's actually moving the deadbolt in or out. That's where it's got to use some motors. But just being connected to 
your devices in the house connected back to your phone, etc., isn't using much power. Mm. So you can imagine it doesn't need much power there. So this wireless charging over 10 metres, it's only got to put a tiny amount of charge. Now, I can imagine some people might get a bit nervous about walking near that door because they go, oh, it's charging up that block over there. What's it doing to my inside as I walk through this beam of wireless charging? Well, it all depends on what sort of wavelength of, of radiation it is. Yeah, that's right. And we've talked about non-ionising radiation before. If it's any comfort, and it won't be to some people, but if it's any comfort at all, the FDA in the US has said that this is safe. So they've given it the tick of approval to say it's not going to cause cancer, it's not going to cause... What do we say? It's infrared. It's infrared, It's yeah. the same stuff as you would come out of your normal conventional oven the infrared radiation that cooks your food. But it's not going to cook your body because it's too weak. Correct. So if it was trying to run something like a large industrial electric motor, sure, maybe I'd be a bit more concerned. But when it's just trying to keep a trickle charge going to a battery in a lock that uses it occasionally, then I feel quite comfortable with that. And the FDA has obviously done their research on that. And it would be like um, pointing a TV remote control at yourself and just hitting the button again and again and again and again and again and again and again. I can't imagine too much going to happen to you that way. Well, Paul Hogan, the comedian from Australia many, many decades ago, did a very funny skit about that, worried about where do the remotes go? And he imagined this room with you hit the remote button on the controller and one's used by the TV and then the rest are bouncing around the room forever. What happened to them all? So Paul wasn't a scientist, by the way. He was a comedian. So, So this is quite incredible. We will see other devices powered by wireless charging in the future we will actually get to the point where our phones will be charged we'll have a vague area we can put our phones in our room Mm. at some point in time in the next few years that will charge but this year knowing that the lock is always going to be in about the same spot knowing that you plug your actual device into a power point somewhere nearby we've got some known perimeters there and we've got a very small amount of power But this is the first one. This is the first smart deadbolt that I've seen like this, the Mm. first device that we know that we can charge wirelessly over a distance, but it's just the beginning, I think. And 10 metres is significant. That's It is, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. They actually do say that you can charge more than one at a time. And as you can imagine, when it's outputting that power, it's outputting that power in every direction. Nikola Tesla's problem again. So you could have a lock on the front door and a lock on the side door, and as long as they're both within 10 metres of your transmitter, they would actually both charge up from there. So 10 metres is a fair distance, but again, I come back to that point, it's a small amount of power. But this is just the beginning. We will talk about more devices, I guarantee it, that will be charging wirelessly and powered wirelessly. And watch this space. Electronic infrastructure is something that we tend to take for granted in 2023. But when I moved house last year, I hadn't really thought about the implications of going from a house with optic fibre to the premises to a home with merely fixed Wi-Fi for its internet feed. It made for some very urgent conversations from a very desperate adolescent with a suddenly redundant Xbox, let me tell you. Well, in England, legislation has just been passed that all new homes must be fitted with a gigabit internet fitting as standard. And Matt, my son is checking out the UK real estate pages as we speak. I'm concerned, James. A rookie error, if ever I've seen a rookie error, <laughs> moving house without checking internet is the yeah. first thing you do. Well, look, I, I knew what sort of internet we were moving into with a fixed Wi-Fi, and I thought, yeah, that'll be fine. <laughs> no, no, I hadn't done my research. Indeed, and I did actually talk about this many years ago when we were just starting to get our rollout of the NBN, and I did kind of guesstimate at some point in the future, I didn't really know when, but at some point in the future I said, When you're moving into a house today, you obviously assume it's got power and you assume it's got water and sewerage Mm. and they're basics. Yeah, that's right. They're a given. And at some point in the time, I I said it might be a decade away, but at some point in time in the future, we'll say, oh, it's got those things, those basics and internet connection because it's just such a basic requirement, even though it might have seemed like a luxury at the time, just Mm. such a basic requirement. But we're going further now. It's Mm. not just... And internet, internet connection, it's how good an internet connection yeah. you've got. And this is one and of the problems. Gigabit. Yeah, that's right. This is one of the problems that you've got here in Australia. We've got the haves and the have-nots, fibre to the premises you mentioned there. Mm. You can get gigabit speeds on the fibre optic cable if you've got fibre to the node or fixed wireless like you mentioned. You don't get gigabit speeds. The UK has seen that this is important enough to actually amend the building regulations code to say that from January 6th this year, Every new home 
must be able to achieve gigabit internet connectivity. Yeah. That is significant. Yeah, I think yeah, that's yeah. huge. Now, this is the, I love the department, the Department of Digital, Culture, Media and Sport made this announcement. It's an interesting combination of mm. department or Eclectic. concepts. It is a very, very indeed. So they do make one small concession. They say that if a developer says that it's going to cost more than £2,000 per home to actually put a gigabit connection in, they are exempt. And I imagine that's a very rural property somewhere that would have yeah. a long run of fibre optic cable to get to that particular property. So there are some exemptions there, but I think in the UK you would find there'd be very few homes. Now, I then started thinking about it and thought, well, that's interesting for all new homes. I wonder what the penetration is already in the UK, and they've done quite well. At the moment, as we speak today, gigabit broadband is available in 72% of all UK oh, homes. Oh, wow. So that's pretty impressive. Yeah. And I, must have, I thought it must have been a big problem when they actually introduced this law, but it's not as big a problem as I thought about when you think that 72% have already got that. But again, I think they're very conscious about not creating the haves and the have-nots. Mm. Let's make sure we've got this going forward for everyone. The other problem in the UK, which they've now amended as well to make this a bit better, is that the Telecommunications Infrastructure Leasehold Property Act of 2021 says that at the moment, if you're in a unit, set of apartments, that sort of multi-dwelling environment, and you want to put some better connectivity in, some gigabit connectivity, for example, you've got to get permission from the landlord. That makes sense. Mm. But if the landlord doesn't respond, bad luck. Oh, you, you just do it. No, no, you can't, oh, you do, can't it, do it. But they've amended that. Ah, so if right. you don't get a response from the landlord, there are steps you can now take so that you can actually do it. Because in the past, if you're the landlord, I send you an email, hey, James, I want to put internet connection on. Yeah. I'm happy to pay for it. And you go, couldn't be bothered. They might damage the place that I own, whatever. You yeah. just don't respond to me. I can't do anything about it. Yeah. But they've changed that to make it a bit better. And again, that obviously applies to retrospective rather than new ones because new ones will have to fit in with the new legislation but just make it better it just gives you a snapshot doesn't it of where we're headed that it's so important for internet connectivity as just a basic service and internet connectivity at gigabit speeds yeah. there was a prime minister or a budding prime minister in australia who was talking about 25 megs who would need more than 25 megs <laughs> well here we are talking about 40 times that speed yeah. as a basic process and again we know from other articles that we've talked about 10 gigabit speed is not unusual in some places across the US, for example. So gigabit speeds is a basic sort of <laughs> level. Well, Sounds I'm wondering incredible. what sort of uh, world we're going to live in where people are going to go, oh, I've only got gigabit speeds. <laughs> That's well, it's, Things it's, are happening too It's slowly. getting to that point now where people are saying, I've only got 25 or 50 megs. Yeah. Oh, I've only got 100 megs. So it doesn't take very long for it to accelerate. And the things that we're doing with these connections now, mm. we could not have imagined when we first started talking about the NBN. It's gone forward so much, so dramatically. Absolutely. Android phone users are set to get an upgrade. And for those who tend to find themselves off the grid quite a bit, it'll be a major game changer. Many Android phones will very soon have satellite connectivity. Matt, this is big news for folks in rural Australia. Big news for folks in rural areas across the world, actually. It's a partnership that's being created between Iridium, and you might remember Iridium, very exciting back in about 1997, where Iridium launched a range of satellites to give you satellite service. So you could be out in the middle of the desert in Australia and actually still get phone connection. Iridium, the company, mm. didn't go so well going forward, but the concept was fantastic. So Iridium now has done a partnership arrangement between Qualcomm, the chip giant, who makes, obviously, chips for a range of mobile phones, and Iridium, so that not that you'll use this for everyday connectivity, for making phone calls on, etc. You'll still buy a satellite phone to do that. This is designed to have, I'd probably call it emergency coverage, but just the ability to send and receive messages when you might be out of range of yeah. a mobile phone tower. Okay. Now, this is for Android phones in particular. You may remember that back when the iPhone 14 was launched in September 2022, that one of the big announcements was that iPhone would have this ability to be able to connect to a satellite in an emergency situation. 
the little asterisk next to that was in North America and Canada only. <laughs> now they're getting there. Obviously, that will happen yeah. across the world. But again, competition does wonderful things. So Apple came out with that announcement. So obviously, Android phones have said, well, we need something as well. It's not there yet. So you can't go and take your normal Android phone and say, that's great. I can now start to send and receive messages via satellite. But it will be in new models coming out and going forward. The higher-end models, I would imagine, mainly. It won't be the very cheap lower-end spec models. It'll be the higher-end models. But this is really exciting. And I just still find it fascinating that you've got a mobile phone that's built to connect to a tower that might be a few hundred metres away, a few kilometres away, Mm. and suddenly connecting to satellites. And these are low-Earth orbit satellites, so we're not talking about geostationary satellites. Low-Earth orbit can be 500, maybe 700 kilometres above the Earth. Yeah, even 200 kilometres. Yeah, Yeah, in that whole range there. So you're still going a bit further than 5 or 10 kilometres or 20 kilometres that you might go when you're talking about terrestrial satellites. You're going up a long way. So the fact that they can do that now, it's small amounts of data. We're talking about messages. So we're not talking about a voice call. A voice call is obviously a lot of data. We're not talking about internet connectivity. That's a lot of data as well. Mm. But we're talking about two-way communications. A GPS device doesn't need to be very clever to receive signals from a satellite. It's just a receiver. It doesn't have to transmit those signals back up to a satellite. But a phone that's sending and receiving messages has to receive them, but also has to get the message back up to the satellite. And I think that's pretty impressive. I'm not not sure if most of our listeners are are impressed by that, but I'm certainly (laughs) impressed by that. Uh, Keep in mind that this is obviously designed for outdoor usage. If you're inside, if you had a roof above your head, then no, you're not going to be able to see that satellite. But that's the same for any satellite phone. Mm. You need to be able to see that satellite you know, able to see the sky effectively. Mm. You don't have to spot the actual satellite as such, but you need to be able to see the sky for it to be able to get the signal back up to the satellite. But I just think this is quite incredible how we're progressing with this coverage. All these towers that we see being built and lots of towers are being built around the place. The idea that internet connectivity to geostationary is okay is a bit flawed because you get that latency with these towers, with yeah. the, the satellites at 36,000 kilometres. But when we start talking about things like Starlink, things like Iridium, those low Earth orbits, we're going to see more and more coverage in this way. And guess what? It's wireless again. It's still, this is a Nikola Tesla (laughs) show, I'm sure. Everything's about wireless these days. Chat GPT. If you haven't heard of this groundbreaking technology, then strap yourselves in, folks. The world is about to change in a big way. Now, as a teacher who began his trade in an age of the electronic typewriter, before the internet was really a thing even, I have seen a lot of changes in education and in how written material is produced, period. But there are thick grey clouds brewing overhead as ChatGPT era is uh, is descending upon us. Matt, I don't want to be an alarmist, but I'll make it public that I've started my doomsday prepping already. (laughs) Good, good. (laughs) Well, I asked a good friend of mine to just write me a short paragraph about the status of chat GBT. And I won't give you his whole answer that he gave me, but I'll just give you a couple of paragraphs. My fellow citizens, the time has come. The future is here. And it is called chat GBT. This revolutionary AI chatbot website is here to change the world. And we must embrace it for our strength and determination. I know that many of you are eager to try chat GPT for yourselves. And I assure you, We are doing everything in our power to make that happen. Our team is working tirelessly to accommodate the incredible demand for this groundbreaking technology. And on it goes. Of course, my good friend there was ChatGPT. (laughs) And it's pretty scary. You can ask a question of ChatGPT exactly like that and you'll get something that sounds pretty impressive, even throwing in my fellow citizens to start the conversation. Mm. New York so relatable. It is. <laughs> New York schools have actually banned the use of chat GPT, which I'm sure mm. every school in essence, because it sounds like plagiarization of some way or cheating in some way, shape or form. But the problem is that the New York schools that have banned the use of chat GPT have blocked the site in their computers on the school grounds. Yeah. But kids have computers at home. Kids have internet do. connections away from the school. So they can still go home and actually use it. And they've already seen evidence of people writing essays about the cause of the American Civil War or all sorts of things that are Mm. completely written by ChatGPT. And that's the scary part. Now, the interesting part at the moment is 
This is all still very early. It only launched at the end of November. So we've only had this going for a little over a month. Mm. It's really just trying to train the technology, get the technology better by questions being asked, then feedback being given, and then by the AI learning about that as it goes forward. So this is the really scary part. It's actually bad for scams as well because we see scams where the messages are written very poorly. They might have translated from another language. You can pick up some really obvious errors. But when you start to look at something written by chat GPT, it's written with correct grammar. It's written to make it sound like a uh, human has written this. Yeah. And, and so the conspiracy <laughs> theorists out there are not going to trust anything that's written anymore. No, but here's the other interesting part. And I'm going to become a conspiracy theorist. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it, <I'll> sounds, be- <laughs> it sounds like fun, doesn't it? <laughs> I actually said to chat GPT, how do I know if an essay is written by a human or AI? I thought it goes straight to the source. If yeah. we want to know how do we detect this, we can surmise all we like, but let's go and ask chat GPT itself. And I got an answer back that said something along the lines of, if you want to see if something's written by AI, then you need to look for the absence of personal experiences or emotions or maybe some analysis, some human analysis mm. might be in there, and also some inconsistencies in the writing style. But gee, some of those things are pretty tough to answer, yeah. aren't they? And in your field, if you had a student writing something at a very scientific level, you don't expect them to put emotions in. You don't no, want no, you don't want emotive writing at all. No, that's right. You want factual writing. You want things that are devoid of emotions, devoid of their opinions. You want some analysis, obviously. Uh, yes, our, our our big our gateway there is is the analysis. We yeah, need, yeah. That's right. Need to ask questions that require students to to think about things mm. rather than just regurgitate facts. So that'd be the way. But gee, that's a tough gig for any teacher at school mm. or university to read essays analyzing the work that's been done by the student to see whether the student deserves a certain grade, but then in the back of their mind also thinking, I'll just keep an eye out for the analysis and the way it's been done and do I think an AI has written this or not. So, How long before ChatGPT learns how to do analysis? <laughs> well, that's right. Or to put some <laughs> experiences in to learn from some of the answers that ChatGPT or other similar tools gets back. But this is incredibly scary, incredibly scary for educators, but incredibly scary for a whole range of things. I hope, I hope they're all going to follow Isaac Asimov's laws for robots as well. Well, that's another thing, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and again, just looking at a journalist and seeing the stories that a journo might write, and again, seeing how that analysis might be done for a journalistic story. And again, you'd expect a, a true journalist to remove emotions and mm. personal stories from a story they're writing about the news. But are all those journos out there now thinking, do I have a job tomorrow? Is ChatGPT going to answer all yeah. these? So go and have a look at it. It's, a, it's really exciting, <laughs> quite amazing. Uh, but again, this is just one of so many. And these are available in the public domain. That's the incredible part. It's not some university researchers no. playing with it. This is in the public domain because they figured that the learning will happen much quicker if more people are using this well, I was technology. watching um, the news uh, last night, actually, and there was an academic from um, one of the leading universities in the country, and um, she was saying, we've got to learn how to embrace this and make it a tool that, that becomes useful for us. Well, I suppose that's right, isn't it? It's not about saying... But that's still daunting, I've got it to is, say. It is, <laughs> but it's, it's probably a bit like standing at the ocean shore and putting your hand up and saying, I just want to stop the ocean coming in. I sort of stop the tides. Well, you're not going to do that. So how do you work with the tides? And in this case, maybe our fear is misplaced. Maybe we need to embrace and see Mm. how we can take advantage of this. Yep, it's too too late. The the ball is already already rolling. In the world of engineering, you may be forgiven for thinking that bigger is almost always better. Well, this next story will do nothing to change that impression. With wind farming undergoing somewhat of a boom in the North Sea at the moment, development of this sort of magnitude requires some fairly mammoth construction equipment of its own. So get this. A boat taller than the Eiffel Tower has been built in China and is currently in transit to the North Sea to build the biggest offshore wind farm in the world. Matt Just how big is big enough? (laughs) So now, apparently, the Eiffel Tower is a unit of measurement. We talk about various (laughs) units of measurement. How many Eiffel Towers? How how tall is your boat? (laughs) So this is in Dogger Bank, which is off the northeast coast of England. 
and they are constructing a very large wind farm there. Now, we have talked about it, in fact, only last week. We talked about the fact that England has a fairly small land mass compared to their population. So they do do more offshore wind farms because they've got more ocean around Mm. there than they can use. And in Australia, we talked about the fact that we were just getting our first offshore wind farm going. They've done many, but this particular one at Dogger Bank is big. It will power, once it's up and running, it will power about 6 million UK homes. Wow. So that's big. All with gigabit uh, internet. <laughs> that's, right, that's right. Hopefully they've taken it into account with their calculations. So that's large, but they're doing it with larger and larger wind turbines. And that makes sense. You build one connection to that wind turbine, you've got one facility, one tower to maintain, to build, all the rest of it, making them larger and larger makes sense. We're talking about getting to the stage where you're doing 14 megawatt turbines. Mm. And we've got some near us, some turbines only 30 or 40 kilometres away from where we are sitting right at this moment. And I think from memory, they're about 1.5 megawatt wind turbines. They might be 2 megawatt but they're not very large compared to 14 megawatt. Yeah, wow. Now, again, we're talking about offshore here, and the way they do that, obviously, is they just put bigger and bigger blades on them, but bigger blades have a larger swept area, they need a taller tower, and then when you want to go and put them out in the ocean, you need some way of doing all of that. What you do do is you build a ship to actually construct that. You build a dedicated ship to do all this construction. This particular one is or has got 130 meter long legs, and then with they go down to the sea floor. Yeah, I had to look at this on the net, and folks, you do yourself a favour and and, and Google this thing because it's amazing. So from the sea floor up to the top where they're actually doing it, it's basically a large crane, 336 meters from the base to the top. Yeah, wow. So that's big. The Ability for it to lift a weight, so the the main deck crane on there can lift three thousand two hundred tons. And just for those people that don't understand tons as a unit, that's twenty two times the weight of the Statue of Liberty, which is also <laughs> another normally recognised weight processor or weight <laughs> um, weight uh, unit. So effectively, you've got this huge ship. Now you think that's fairly specialised, and I understand for this one wind farm they might need that. Well, this ship is booked out for the next three years. So the projects that are lined up for this ship are already stretching out for the next three years. So you think maybe someone will build another ship. Well, no. There are 20 more ships of a similar physical size either under construction or being converted as we speak because of the demand for wind turbines that we'll see out in various offshore implementations. Goodness me. So you are getting some very large wind turbines. This whole process for those 20 ships, they'll all be done and out there being used by the year 2025. So they're happening quickly. Ships aren't quick things to build. So this is all happening very quickly. That whole wind farm that we're talking about there at Dogger Bank will be up and fully operational by 2026. So things are happening and they're happening very quickly. So for those people who don't like the idea of wind turbines, close your eyes when you're flying over the ocean or if you're out on a cruise ship somewhere. But I can see these being part of cruise ship routes where people will go along on a cruise ship on a holiday and they'll say check them out that's right we're going past the abc wind turbine farm that powers so many homes or there'll be an interest perspective in that i think i've been on planes where a pilot has sometimes come over when he's talking about the weather and things like that that we should be checking on our phones i've i've seen the pilot say oh, and on the right hand side we've got the 50 wind turbines of some particular wind farm there because i think people are quite Interested. Some people don't like them, obviously, but people mm. are quite interested and fascinated by them. So out in the ocean, I actually find it quite interesting when, you, when you're out in the ocean and then seemingly in the middle of nowhere, these wind turbines pop up out of nowhere. Yeah, very interesting to see. Online shoppers are a key target for internet scams and fashion chain Dotty has sent out alarm bells warning customers of fake websites that replicate their own sites so very closely. Matt, the internet is a jungle full of biting insects and stinging nettles and animals that want to eat you. Are we getting to a stage where the internet is just best avoided completely? Oh, no, don't go there, please. <laughs> now, I've got to ask you the question, have you ever purchased something from Dotty? Never. Have you ever heard of Dotty? Not. Uh, so Sorry, Dotty people, but um, it's a fashion chain which I will admit that I haven't heard of either. I've never bought something from Dotty, but I'm probably not big in my fashion. It was a technology site, maybe, but I'm not big in my fashion. But it is a huge site. 
there are two victims, and I hadn't thought about this before, there are two victims when we see scammers at their work. There are the victims that get their money taken when they think they're buying a legitimate product, mm. but there's the actual company that has a legitimate site mm. that people are thinking they're buying things from that are missing out on income. And the fact that Dottie have actually gone as far and they've sent out messaging via their social media, direct mail to their various customers to say, be warned, there are fraudulent sites out there who are replicating the Dotty site. Now, that's got to hurt sales. Yeah. If you get a message from Dotty to say, be careful of this, then you're going to think twice about that next purchase and you may not make any purchase or you may go to a competitor because you haven't seen a message from them about something that's replicating but this their site. this is just Dotty, right? So there's got to be others out there as well, surely. One of the things that seems to be where we're headed a lot with these scams now, and this is exactly what Dotty's talked about, is that they have replicated these sites so very well. They look mm. exactly like the Dotty site. And you can imagine, it's not that hard for someone to take an existing site to copy the information that's on there and make it look exactly the same, using the same language, using the same products, all those things. You might even make it just a little bit cheaper than the Dotty site because someone says, oh, I saw that product on the Dotty site for $300, but... This is other site. Oh, that must be their special site. I'll go to that <laughs> special site or whatever it might be for $280 and I'll go and buy it from that one. Dottie have said, and there's a few things here, they've said go to only our genuine dottie.com.au or dottie.co.nz if you're in New Zealand. Only go to those sites. Most people don't look at the domain name no. that's sitting up there in the address bar when they go onto their browser. So that's a tough But this one. is all just part of a modern education in using the internet, isn't it? Yeah, correct. The other way, and so that's that's from Dottie themselves, but when you've got the ACCC's scam watch, they also give you hints about how to avoid scams. One of the things they've said is that some of these sites, when you go to make a payment, you've got your normal payment methods, so credit card, for example, PayPal maybe, but they said that often they'll only take payments via money order or a preloaded money card or wire transfer, mm. some of those ones where you can't get the money back. Yeah, you're right. not going through your bank. You're not going through some sort of trusted in, uh, intermediary in terms of that transaction. So that's one way to do it. As soon as you see Dottie come up, or maybe you can get this price, paying on credit card, but this is the cheaper price if you pay by a direct transfer. Oh, great, I'll do that method. And, of course, that direct transfer never comes back in the other direction mm. and you never get the product. Although Scamwatch did say that in some of these instances, you will actually receive a product. So you'll order a particular product, you'll get a non-genuine version of that product that ah, that particular company... A knockoff. That's right, a knockoff might have sourced for dramatically less because they want to keep getting you back, keep getting you to shop at that particular site over and over. That's one example of what could happen. Most of the time you just get a big fat nothing. Mm. So you'll go and make your purchase and nothing will come through. It is one of those things. Be aware of it. It is frustrating. It is annoying. And it is absolutely happening out there. Now, it's been a couple of days since Elon Musk has made a headline and he's gotten a bit fidgety and decided to drop another bomb bombshell and it's about his new toy, Twitter, again. Matt, forgive me, but twi is Twitter about to melt here? <laughs> and if it does, is it going to create enormous seismic activity around the globe, do you think? I think it'll just create more activity on other social media outlets. And that's, mm. that's exactly the risk I see here. Now, way back when Twitter started, it was a maximum of 140 characters. Mm. Now, there was a logical reason for that. It was based around text messaging, which was, if you remember, back in the very old days, you had a 160-character maximum for a text message. Twitter used that same technology, but it needed a bit of overhead, so it stole 20 characters for some other bits of data. So you had 140 characters. And what people liked about that, in particular, a lot of media outlets, a lot of journos liked that because you had a very limited space, which meant you had to get straight to the point. Short and sharp. Short and sharp, that's right. And that's what people loved about Twitter in the early days. Now, Jack Dorsey, the former CEO, made a huge announcement in 2017. Technology had moved way past that 160-character limit that we first had with text messages. You know yourself now. Mm. You get messages much longer than 160 characters. So the technology had moved on, but Twitter had stayed with that 140-character maximum for a long time. But in 2017, Jack Dorsey made the announcement that it was doubling the character limit to 280 characters. And that was a huge announcement. And many people said, oh, no, it's the death of Twitter at that announcement. Obviously, it wasn't. And we've continued on with Twitter. But Elon Musk said, 280? <laughs> That's not a character limit. 
I'm going to increase the character limit to 4,000 characters. Now, many people on the Twitterverse are saying, well, how's Twitter different now? How is Twitter different yeah. to Facebook or to Instagram or to other social media sites? What's its unique selling proposition now? Why do I want to use Twitter if I've now got the same number of characters? So that means people can talk on and on and on rather than be limited. And when they're trolling someone, they can really troll them. Oh, that's right. Now, you used to see as as they want to be. some people in the past where they would put multiple tweets to tie together a story, if you like, but that wasn't a lot of people. And you kind of got to the stage where people didn't take a lot of notice of that. They really had to get down to that 280 character limit. So I just I don't know what Elon's thinking with this particular move. I'm not convinced that it makes a lot of sense. You had something that was different, you had something that was unique, and now you're saying let's just make it the same as well, everyone else. He he moved into the, the seat there um, uh, in the CEO's uh, office there um, with a bit grumpy, didn't he? And uh, so he's <laughs> <laughs> just going about dismantling it all. Maybe you're right. The other thing that he's doing is a swipe right, swipe left between recommended versus followed tweets. That's another oh. feature. Now, I, I'm not a user of Tinder. I actually celebrated my 28th wedding anniversary just yesterday. So I've been married for a long time. And, and I, I wasn't on the dating scene when, when Tinder came around. I was well and truly married by then. So I never know which is the right way to swipe left or right. But obviously, Elon said that if it works for Tinder, then we may as well have it work for us as well. But swipe right, side left. You've got to think about it. Which is the right way to go if I want to follow this tweet or if I want to just recommend? Oh, I can't remember now. Having a button there you click on, which is what you do now, mm. seems to make sense. Going right and left, it's just like he's grabbing at anything at the moment to mm. see what's out there, what's working. Oh, we'll stake that idea and, and extra characters. We'll grab that idea as well. And I'm not sure that he really has a definitive plan. I, I like to think with his huge success in business, who am I to question what Elon does? <laughs> But I like to think hidden away behind all of this is some master plan, but it just doesn't just, seem that way at the moment. It just seems like a hat full of crazy right now. Yeah, that's right. It seems to be just grabbing at anything, doesn't it? Mm. And so as the mob of Twitter devotees with their pitchforks and burning torches assemble in the town square, we're going to find cover and shut this episode down. Thanks for another cracking tech talk, Matt. And I assume that everyone's listening to this in some sort of wireless way because it has been a wireless episode. So <laughs> wireless headphones with your wireless phone, maybe with your wireless internet connection, who knows? And if you're still listening to it wired up, then change your ways. I'm off to draw some plans for my doomsday bunker to hide away from the Twitter mob and chat GPT. I think I'll start by picking up a couple of those wireless smart deadlocks, actually. Thanks for tuning in to Tech Talk with Matthew Dickerson once again, folks. I'm your host, James Eddy, reminding you not to click on links in unsolicited SMS messages and warning you to take care when internet shopping and to be mindful that angry Twitter trolls can now abuse you in 4,000 characters. And if you're going to use ChatGPT to do your assignments for you, be aware that you're still going to have to sit in the game sometime, so just be aware. Catch you in a week's time.